Hey, my name is Nathaniel Fawson. I'm an archaeologist. I have been in for over 10 years, and this channel is dedicated to the archaeology of North America prior to colonization, in particular the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. So today I want to talk about frogs, specifically the family known as Bifonidae, which most people call toads. At village sites around the Appalachian Summit region from the very late portion of the pre-contact period and then some into the uh, colonization period, archaeologists have found remains of pits and structures that are full of frog bones. And when I say full, I'm talking about thousands of frog bones in some cases. In North Carolina, these are found at the Garden Creek Mound site, the Warren Wilson site, the Ravensford site, the Coweta Creek site, and also the Smokemont site. These are all high elevation sites in Western Carolina. And these kinds of frog remains are not found in these numbers at lower elevations, even though these kinds of frogs are abundant in the entire region. So the question is, what are they doing there? And there are three basic possibilities. Uh, one, people are using these frogs for food. Two, most controversially, people were harvesting these, uh, these toads for their bufotoxins, which are usable as sometimes as a hallucinogenic drug and sometimes for poisons for, you know, arrows or blowgun darts or things like that. But it's also possible that people who constructed these sites dug these pits for food storage and things like that as like root cellars, and then these frogs jumped into them and died there because they couldn't get back out because the walls are so steeply sided that they couldn't climb their way out. Uh, I've seen this on archaeological sites more times than I can count. We leave for the weekend, we come back, the excavation we're working on is still open, and there's animals down in the bottom that we have to dig out. This is a normal process when uh, human excavation is, you know, is involved. So figuring out which of these three possibilities is being represented on these archaeological sites is what Tom White and Matt Compton are trying to figure out in this research paper. And full disclosure, Tom was the guy who trained me to be an archaeologist way back in the day in undergrad. Um, everything from field excavation technique to lithic analysis and zooarchaeology, that all started in his classroom. I took like six of his classes. So going through these sites, at Garden Creek, there is a Mississippian mound called Mound 1, and it has two earth lodges. One of them contained 344 bones from the genus Anaxiris, and none of these came from the animal's skull or jaw. That's going to be a recurring theme. At the Mississippian Warren Wilson site, which is a village, more than 1,400 toad bones were identified. Over 400 of those came from an individual feature adjacent to the village's palisade, and of the entire assemblage, only 27 came from the head of the frog. These were squamosal, which is a bone that's kind of toward the back and on the side, not attached to the spinal column, but right next to it. The Ravensford site was occupied mostly between the 1100s and the 1700s, and bones recovered from those later periods of occupation number more than 1,200 individual toad bones. And the head elements, again, are conspicuously absent. And at Smokemot, they found 4,000 animal remains. 70% of those were frog bones, but only 5 out of every 1,000, 0.5%, were from the animal's head. And finally, at Coweta Creek, which is a town that dates between about 1300 and 1700 AD, they found more than 9,000 toad bones, most of these were from adult individuals, and bones from the head were, again, absent. Most of these bones in general came from a singular, circular, flat-bottomed, steep-sided pit feature called Feature 65. And this feature was dated to the very beginning of the village. Actually, the dates come back in sort of the mid to late 1200s, right as the village is being constructed. So, there are three possible explanations for the abundant presence of these toads without there being any heads associated with them. First, it's possible that the 
cranial elements are less dense and more fragile than the rest of the body. So they're going to decompose faster. It's also possible that the shape and texture of these frog head elements are hard to identify, especially for lab technicians. Most lab technicians are not specifically trained as zooarchaeologists, so when they're doing their sort, they may misidentify these as plant detritus, chunks of like leaf and bark and root and stuff like that that get thrown away, and so it never gets to the zooarchaeologist to get analyzed in the first place. It's also possible that people living in the Appalachian summit region used toads in some way that involved beheading them, and the heads were discarded in a place that is different from the rest of the body, somewhere at the surface, uh, not altogether, where scavengers and decomposition processes are going to make them break down, and so they'll never be recovered while the mass of the bodies gets thrown in a particular refuse pit, and so those do get preserved and identifiable, and are identifiable. So in order to figure out uh, what an assemblage of toad bones should look like if it's just a bunch of toads hopping into a, a hole in the ground and never being able to cr crawl their way back out, White did an experiment. He took a bunch of students up to a house that I believe belongs to one of his family members. And the house has these window well structures, which are these pits that are in front of the windows that go down into the basement. And these window wells have not been cleaned out in about 65 years. They have just been, you know, accumulating material, some of which is animal material. And the owner of the house, uh, he mentions, he's talking about having to, like, rescue animals that have fallen in and not been able to get out in the past. So animals are falling in here and dying there. And these are considered an acceptable analog for these archaeological storage pits because they are of a similar depth and they are also steep-sided, so it's difficult for animals to get back out. So what he had the students do is excavate these in five centimeter levels, screen everything through uh, three sizes of mesh, quarter inch, eighth inch, and sixteenth inch. That sixteenth inch is mentioned in text as 1.6 millimeters. That's about uh, one sixteenth of an inch. And then took them back to the lab for analysis. Now, because of who Tom is, he had the students do the sort first. He had them sort out the frog and toad bones and other animal remains from the kind of plant detritus, the leaves and bark pieces and stuff like that. But before he threw away the, you know, the trash, he went back behind them and double-checked their work. And what he found was that about 30% of frog head elements were misidentified as plant remains and would have been thrown away. This compares to the rest of the body, which is between 15 and 10%. 15% um, for the axial column, so like the, the spinal column to the pelvis, and 10% for the appendicular uh, elements, which are the arms and legs and feet and so on. So White and Compton summary of the situation is that Bones of the head are less likely to remain preserved over time, less likely to be recovered using mesh sizes larger than 1.6 millimeters, and less likely to be recognized as bones by inexperienced laboratory personnel. So this is creating a problem of equifinality. Basically what we get is this pattern that we see in the archaeological record of lots of body elements and very few head elements can be the result of deliberate human beheading of these animals and differential discard, or it can be the result of natural decomposition processes, biases in recovery, and biases in identification by lab techs who are not trained as zooarchaeologists specifically. So these can end up having the same fundamental result. Fortunately, we got another chance at this. Coweta Creek had about 22 pounds of material that had been wet screened through all three sizes of screen mesh, which is unusual. Typically, we only use quarter inch or sometimes eighth inch. It's very rare for field archaeologists to end up using that uh, 16th inch mesh for much of anything. More more common in university digs, I, I, uh, I guess, but... Yeah, in most field circumstances, we don't use it very much. So anyway, 
he had about 22 pounds of this material that was able to be sorted. So again, he had the students go through and sort out the animal bone remains from everything else. He double checked their work and that combined effort produced over 12,000 more toad bones. 12,492 toad specimens, individual bones. So of those, only 49 were from the head, the skull and the jaw. And that ex extreme disparity cannot be explained by preservation recovery and identification biases. Even with those three factors biasing against head elements at the normal rates that he's identified experimentally, that number should be in the hundreds if those frog heads had been deposited with the rest of the body. There are two really important text references that Compton brings to this whole discussion. He identified, a, I believe it was him who identified the ethnographic account discussing that the Chickamauga Cherokee who lived down more in the low country around like Chattanooga, they have a derogatory term for high country Cherokee. They call them frog eaters, which is a slur term. There's also a Cherokee cookbook that, I, that he came across. I, I know this one was Compton called uh, Cherokee Cook Lore Preparing Cherokee Foods which describes a recipe for preparing toads for cooking, and it specifically mentions twisting the head off and skinning the animal and discarding all of that material, presumably to remove the, uh, the bufotoxin containing pads on the back of the neck so that you can eat these things. And these sites that we're, we're talking about that are full of toad remains come from Cherokee high country territory. So the shoe fits. The experiment also found that individual toads that were trapped in the window wells came from a full range of size classes, we'll say. So very young toads, very uh, like intermediate and fully grown adult toads, which is the expected pattern you get for inadvertent entrapment and intrusive animal remains. At the archaeological sites, the bias is much more towards big, meaty, full-grown toads. So taken all together, it does appear that these toad-filled deposits are the refuse from a big meal consumed by ancestral Cherokee people living in the Appalachian summit. There are some other ideas that they present in the paper about the fact that so many of these are found in features directly associated with the construction of the Palisades early on in the life of the village, uh, it's possible that there was a big toad feast associated with this construction. It kind of reminds me of like chicken wings. They're like individually small and not a whole lot of meat on them. But if you get a bunch of them together and cook them in mass, then it actually turns into a sizable meal. And in the springtime, when it's actually easiest to dig the post holes that you need to put these palisades up, that's when all the frogs are around. And this is something that kids, the elderly, the people who are not physically fit enough to uh, help with the construction of the palisade, they can be out foraging these things. That's within their, you know, scope of, of capability. So taken all together, it does appear that these toad-filled deposits are the product of meals. That's really all I've got to say about all that. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments, you can leave those down below. I always look forward to reading them. And as always, thank you for watching.